Okay, so this is another uh, video uh, under the tension members title. Uh, we are still uh, under this, uh, this topic, which is tension member. Uh, and today we are going to uh, talk about different contents. This is part four, and this is, maybe there is going to be another part. The, the last part is going to be for the design. But today I'm going to uh, like cover these contents in uh, tension member uh, design and, uh, and other issues. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the staggered fasteners. And after that, I'm going to talk about the block shear failure. And then I'm going to talk about the slenderness of tension members, three different topics for today. Okay. Let's go and talk about the staggered fasteners. So, in tension members, connection is made with bolts. The net area will be maximized if the fasteners are placed in single line. This means that if we have something like this, so if we have like a member and we can put it, all the fasteners to be like this, okay, then it's okay for us, we can do. But the problem is we do not have this length to make all the fastener look like this. So we are going to make it, okay, to be more concise, we are going to make it like something like this. Okay? Or maybe we are going to make a staggered, okay, staggered uh, connection, as you can see here. This is what we call it, call it staggered. Okay? Sometimes this space limitation, such as the limit on dimension A here, we have a limitation on this dimension, in this figure, necessitates using more than one line. So we need to use another line here, not only one line as I mentioned here. If so, the reduction in cross-section area is minimized. The reduction in the cross-sectional area is going to be minimized. If the fastener are arranged in a staggered pattern, because instead of like having them like this, this for example, we are shifting one of them a little bit so that we are going to have this pattern here. They are not in the same line. So, if so, reduction in cross-sectional area is minimized if the fastener are arranged, the fasteners are arranged in a staggered pattern as, as shown. Okay, so instead of making it like this, we are going to stagger, stagger them. Okay, making it as this one, for example. Okay, like something like this. Okay. Sometimes staggered, staggered fasteners are required by geometry of the connection. Okay. Sometimes we have no control over it, like, like this one, for example. Okay. So in this case, we have no way. It must be staggered. We cannot make it like in other way. In either case, cross-section, whether here or here, the cross-section passing, passing through holes will pass through fewer holes than if the fasteners are staggered. Okay? So in this case, this is, we are going to look to potential failure surface, for example, here. Okay? In either case, any cross-section passing through holes will pass through fewer holes than if the fasteners are staggered. That's definitely right. Okay, because if we are going to take this section or this section or this one or this one, it is definitely the whole area here or the area is going to be larger than if that we are taking the same line. Okay. If the amount of stagger is small, the influence of an offset hole may be filled by nearby cross section. Okay. And the fracture along an inclined path such as A, B, C, D. Look here, A, B, C, D. And this figure is possible. Okay. So that's the point that even that we are staggering them, but we're going to find that maybe there is a potential failure line here. In such a case, a relationship F equals to P over A, which is the area, okay, does not apply. Because what here at this inclined one, what are the straining actions that are going to be that are going to be developed here? Is it tension only? 
here, this one, the inclined one. So, okay, let's talk about this one here. What are the straining actions here? If we are applying T here or the force here. This is tension, okay, and this one is tension. What about the inclined one? Yes, so we're going to have tension and shear here. So this means that our stress is not going to be P over A. There is something else that we need to, okay, does not apply. This will not apply. And the stress on the inclined portion, which is BC, are a combination of tensile and shearing stresses. Okay, so we need to have some approximation for this. We need to have some approximation for this. So there are several approximate methods have been proposed to account for the effects of this uh, inclined line of the staggered holes. Okay? So there are like different ways for, for this. One of them it was in like 12, uh, sorry, uh, 1922 proposed that when deducting the area corresponding to staggered hole, if we're talking about a staggered hole, okay, use a reduced diameter. We're not going to use the, the full diameter D we are going to use the reduced diameter, which is D, like D prime, for example, which means that it is going, we are going to take into consideration the effect of this inclined line or the staggeredness of this or the stagger, staggered hull by reducing its diameter by S and G, which is S squared over 4G. What is S? What is G here? This is G and this is S here, we can call them S is the stagger or pitch and of the bolt spacing and direction of loading and G it is the gauge or the transverse spacing. We call it the gauge or transfer spacing. Okay, so we can like say there is uh, S squared minus 4G, this would be reducing the diameter of the hole. This means that in a failure pattern consisting of both staggered and unstaggered holes, use D for holes at the end of transverse line between holes, which is S equal to 0, if we have like something like this. So this line we're going to use if S is 0, then we're going to use D for these holes. So it is going to be D and D. For holes at the end of transverse line between holes. And D prime, which is the reduced D, for holes at the end of an inclined line between holes. So if we have like two holes like this, and we have line here, then we're going to use D prime here and D prime here, for example. Okay, so we are going to end up with the ASIC specification in section D3. It gives us the net width, the net width, which is WN here. This is the net width is equal to the gross width minus the summation of those who are having D and those who are going to be reduced because of the stagger. Uh, location of the staggered line. So we are going to use summation of S squared minus 4G. So as if that we are having the gross width, okay, the gross width minus the, the uh, diameter, the summation of diameter of all holes. But some holes, they are going to be unreduced and other holes are going to be reduced. So that we are going to take into consideration the staggeredness. It, okay, so this is how we are dealing with, or how ASIC is dealing with this kind of staggeredness and taking into consideration. So if I ask you, what is the reason for the reduction? What is the reason of the reduction of the diameter here? What is the main reason? Yes, this is, this is right, but the main reason is that we have inclined line. This inclined line would have or would receive two types of straining action. One is going to be shear, one is going to be tension. 
So our equation, which is f equal to p over a, does not apply, and we need to take into consideration this by using this effect of reduction of the hold. Okay. Okay. So here where Wn is the net width and Wg is the gross width, the second term is the sum of all holes diameters and the third term is the sum of S squared over 4G for all inclined lines in the failure pattern. All inclined, all inclined lines in the failure pattern. The sum of S squared over 4G for all inclined lines. So if we have like something like this for example okay let's assume that these are the inclined lines right so we are going to know what is s here and what is g here for example and then one two three four so we're going to have like four times this s squared over four g we're going to see this in an example okay so we are talking about the number of inclined lines as for all inclined lines in the failure pattern. Okay, now let's jump into an example to make it easier for us. So in this example, compute the smallest net area for the plate shown. This is our plate. The holes are for one inch diameter bolts. So our bolts are one inch. As you can see here, the distance, horizontal distance, it is 3 inches and the vertical distance between the bolts it is 5 inches and the edge distance is 3 inches both, right? Okay, so now we have like S how much S here? In our case, if we are going to talk about any like any line in this direction so S is how much? It is 3, right? We, we do not have anything. It's always 3. Okay. What about G? Yeah, this is 5 here. Right? Okay. So the effective hole diameter is going to be 1 plus tolerance, which is 1 eighth. Okay. So this is going to be 1 and 1 eighth inch for line A, B, D, E. So if we're talking about A, B, D, E. E. Straight line here is going to be the diameter that is going to be used as the whole diameter. There is no reductions here because there is no inclined lines. So the net width is going to be 16. 16 from where? That is we have 5, 5 and 3, 3. So we are going to have 16. This is the total width of this plate. Minus 2 because we have two fasteners. So in this case, we have 2 times 1.125, which is 1 8th, 1 1 8th, okay? It equals to 13.7, okay? So now this is the width or net width based on this failure line. But let's go and investigate another line, which is A, B, C, okay? D and then E, right? So this is our line here. So how many staggered lines that we have or inclined? We have two, right? Okay, so now let's go to the equation. We have WN 16, the width minus 3, because how many diameters that we have? Three fasteners, okay? Three fasteners, all the fasteners in our failure pattern, okay? Times the whole diameter here, which is 1.125, plus the summation of the number of inclined lines times S squared over 4G, right? So we have this two because we have two planes, okay? And this three, it is S, and this G, it is five, okay? So now we have this, which is going to give us 13.52. Which one is less? A, B, D, E, or A, B, C, D, E? Yes, this one is giving us less net width. 
So the inclined one is like the failure pattern that we are going to encounter. So the second condition will give the smallest net area. We're going to use this one. Okay. In this case, the uh, effective net area is going to be T, which is a constant times the width, net width, 0.75, which is the, uh, the, uh, the thickness times the effective or the net width that we have calculated from the second condition, the second case. Okay, now this is T times W, WM. Okay, do you have any questions here? Is it clear for you? And, and T is given here, okay? Three quarters inch. So really it's given for us. Okay. <sighs> okay, I'm not going to explain about this because it's not important actually. Okay. So now let's go to the next part which is the block shear failure. Do you have any questions up to now? Is it clear? Okay, now let's go to the Next part, which is the block shear failure, and let us understand more about it. So, there is a pattern of failure that is, might happen if we have a certain connection configuration. And this certain connection configuration, a segment at the end of the member can tear out. Look to this expression, tear out. So, this means that if you have like look to this coped beam coped beam here we're going to find that this part may tear out right similar here this part might tear out here this part for example already has been moved so this means the shaded block can fail by shear along the longitudinal section and by tension on the transverse section so here, this part, or this surface, is going to receive tensile stresses. However, this part and this part is going to receive shear. Okay, so here we are having shear. However, here we are having tension stresses. This means that our tension, or our, our failure mode, is a combination between shear failure plus tensile failure, okay, or tension failure. Procedure is based on the assumption that rupture or fracture occurs at two failure surfaces. So this is the procedure. We're going to assume that they are going to happen simultaneously, okay? That's important issue because maybe you are going to ask if one is going to happen before the other, then we should study the first and this is going to be the failure mode. But here, as we said, according to AISC, procedures is based on, this is the basic assumption, an assumption that rupture fracture occurs at two failure surfaces. Okay. The shear rupture stress is assumed to be 60% of the tensile ultimate stress. So we're going to use like 0.6 F ultimate for the shear rupture, as we're going to see. Okay. Okay. Now let's go. Regarding angles and gusset plates, we're going to talk about angles and gusset plates, and then we're going to talk about coped beams. So let's start with angles and gusset plate here. So this is the for for gut. This is angles, for example, and this is here for gusset uh, plates. We're going to find this is the part that is going to have the failure. Uh, over here. So if we're going to, this part is going to be teared out and we have tension on this section and we have shear on the upper one, as you can see here. And they are in the same direction. So the nominal strength here is going to be a contribution of two parts. The first one is going to be related to the shear surface which is 0.6 F ultimate, this is the rupture limit for shear, times A and V, A and V, net area along the shear surface. So net area along the shear surface, it is going to be here, this part, this net area along the shear surface, right? And plus F ultimate times NT, 
it is going to be F ultimate A and T, and T net area along the tension surface. And we're going to use F ultimate here, right? Why we didn't use F yield? The question for you. Why here we didn't use F yield? No, it's rapture. It's, it's rapture not yielding. It's rapture not yielding. Again, go back to the basics here. So, procedure is based on the assumption that rupture, fracture, okay, occurs at the two failure surfaces. This means that we're talking about F ultimate, okay, not F yield, right? Okay, so in this case, and we said that in shear, it is 0.6 F ultimate also. This is a kind of given like this. This is a limit for shear, okay? And 0.6 here means that shear is a more serious failure mode, okay? Because we put like 0.6 if yield. We are expecting that, or not more serious, but let's put it in the right wording that the limit for shear is 0.6 if ultimate, okay, of the material. Okay. Okay. Now let's go to the next part, which is for coped beams. For coped beams. Coped beams means that we are having this part of at the end of the beam is going to be loaded with here is tension and here is going to be shear. So the coped beams we have like one equation that is composed of two terms. The first one is the common one, which is 0.6 F ultimate, A and V, which is related to the net area along the shear surface or surfaces. And then the second term is related to F ultimate, A and T, which is related to the shear failure. But we have another thing here appears for us, which is UBS. UBS. And it is in the term of the tension part, tension failure part. Right? And this UBS is going to be one of two values here. One, when the tensile stress is uniform, okay, when the tensile stress is uniform, which is for most beams, and 0.5 when the ten tension stress is non not uniform. Okay? Not uniform means that the coped beams with two lines of poles, which is something like this here. It is like we have two line of bolts. So at the bottom, at the bottom, maybe the uh, the the shear the the, ten, the tension which is at the bottom here. If we have another one, for example, if we have another line here. So actually, the this surface is the tension surface. But we are expecting that it might happen that this part is going to have like different stress and size stresses than this part right because it's it is closer to the uh, to the inner part of the beam okay so if there is like non-uniform then we're going to use 0.5 which is like we have two lines here if it's uniform then it's okay one Okay, so it is very serious because if we have non-uniform ten tensile stress, for example, something like this, this means that this part is going to be highly, going to fracture early. So we need to take into consideration this. So if I ask you what is the reason for UBS, what you should say to me? What is the reason for using UBS? Yes, that's right. In order to control or in order to put some criterion for the non-uniformity of the tensile stress if it would happen. And at the same time, it should not be higher than this value of the net. Nominal strength should not be higher than 0.6 F field area gross plus UBS F ultimate ANT. Here, we are going to find that the same equation is already repeated, but only one part is changed, which is what? Here. The, f the first term here in this equation, which is 
it is coming to be 0 0.6 if field what? Gross. Area gross. Area gross for what? We're talking about gross area in what? In shear. Okay? Which is in the figure. I hope that I put the figure. Okay. Which is going, I didn't put actually here. Okay. Okay, I'm going to show it to, to you. Okay? Which is going to be in figure 520. I didn't put it actually. So it is, it is okay. So here, the point is, we have area gross for shear and we have area net for shear. Right? So gross and net. Okay? So the, the gross area means that inclusion of all the surface, the gross area of the shear. However, here it is going to be the net area along the shear surface. That is, we are going to remove the parts that is not going to contribute to the resistance of the shear, as we are going to see. So we have like two, two values here. So we are afraid of two different failure modes, two different failure modes that might happen on the shear surface. One of them is fracture of the net area. The other one is what? No, it will be yielding of... Okay, that's good that you know this kind. Okay, it is the yielding of the gross area in this case. Okay, so this means that we have like two patterns of failure. We are not sure which one is going to happen. So this is why we put... It should be less than or equal to. Okay, so if I ask you what is the main reason for the upper limit here in this equation, you're going to tell me what is the answer? The upper limit here, we put it why? For what? What is the reason? The reason is we are expecting or we do not want okay, any kind of yielding of the gross shear area to take place. Okay, you understand it? Clear for you? Okay. Now for LRFD, our theta here is 0.75 and for ASD, uh, our safety factor is 2. And I have discussed before why we use these uh, values. Whenever that we have the more serious nature of this failure, because it's rapture, we're talking about rapture here. So definitely we're going to use uh, phi to be 0.75, right? And the safety factor in ASD is going to be 2. Right? As I have explained before. Okay, now let's jump directly to an example and see how we can solve this. Okay. Compute the block shear strength of the tension member shown in this figure. The holes are 7 8 inch diameter bolts with A36 steel as used. Okay. So you can see here this is an angle. And this angle is L3 half, <clears throat> 3 and half by 3 and half by 3 eighths. And we are having 2 inch, which is the distance between the top of the free leg to the center of the fastener. And we have 3 inches uh, fastener distance and 1 and half inch edge distance. Okay? And the bolts are 7 eighths. Okay, now first of all, the shear areas, let's go to the shear areas. We have two types of shear areas, which is area gross and area net, right? For the gross, it is going to be 3 eighths, okay? 3 eighths times 7.5. Okay, this is what we are expecting here. <clears throat> Okay, so it is going to be 3 eighths times 7.5, 7 right? 7.5, it is what? The length, the total length from the center, from here to the edge. Because we have 3 plus 3 plus 1 and half. So it is going to give us 7.5, which is the whole length here from the center line okay and we are going to multiply by 
three eighths. Three eighths is what? Supposedly to be the thickness of this angle, which is three eighths here, right? Okay, which is the thickness of this surface. So we are having this surface as something like this, okay? Which is here, it is going to be 7.5 and here it is going to be 3 eighths, right? This is what we call it the gross shear area. And as you can see, it is from the center line to the edge. Here, this, this line is the center line of this, as, as if that we are taking, we have something like this, here, something like this, here, something like this, and then the edge. Right, so we are taking from here to here. This is the length, the gross area. It's not the total. This part is not going to work for us, this half, but we are starting from here and the projection of it. So this is the total the, the area gross. However, for that the net is going to be used because the net here, if we're going to calculate it, we're going to find that we are having one, two, and half. So, like we are having, we are having like, so like one here diameter and the other one and half of this one, right? So, we're going to use. The same equation here, which is 3 over 8 times 7.5, as we understand, this is 7.5 minus 2 and half, 1, 2 and half, times the diameter itself that we're talking about. It is 7 over 8 plus 1 eighth, which is the tolerance. Then it gives us this value, 1.87, however, the gross area is 2.8, right? So the tension area, this is for the two cases that we have for the shear surface. But for the tension area, we are going to find that the tension area is this area, right? The tension area, we are going to have 3 eighths times 1.5, which is this distance. Which is going to be this distance. Okay, here, we're talking about this distance here, 3.5. Uh, 1.5, which is 3 and half minus 2. So it gives us 1.5 here. And based on this, minus 0.5. What is 0.5 here? What is the meaning of 0.5? Exactly. Half of the fastener. If we're going to like make something like this, for example. And we are, okay, so this is the case. So we are talking about this distance here. Okay. So we are talking about this part. This is half of the, the fastener. So 0.5 times 7 over 8 plus 1 eighth. So it gives us the value for the net area that is going to be used for tension. Well, the last one. Oh, okay, look at this. Why this? Um... <laughs> okay. Okay. So now for this, the the factor of 0.5 is used because there is one half of the whole diameter in the tension. Since the block shear will occur in the in an angle, so UBS is going to be 1. It's not called beam, right? And from AISC equation J4-5, we're going to find RN is going to equal 0.6 F ultimate A and V plus UBS F ultimate A and T. All of these values, we know them, right? 0.6 F ultimate 58 from the tables, okay? From the tables. Okay, and then A and V, already we have obtained it from the previous slide. UBS is 1 because we're not talking about cope beams. F ultimate is 58 from the dimension and properties table. A and T 0.375 as we have obtained it from the previous slide. Then our, our 
Rn is 87. With an upper limit, we are putting an upper limit on it. Four, that we are like excluding any yielding of the gross area and shear, right? So this means that we're going to use 0.6 F yield times area gross here. This is the only difference. 36 times area gross. And the, rem the remainder of the equation will be the same as before. This gives us 82.5. So this means what? We have an upper limit here, 82. However, our equation gives us 87. Which one that we're going to use? 82, right? That is the least one. So this means what pattern of failure is going to take place here? Of what? Yes, that's right. When this block shear is going to take place, when this block shear is going to take place, you say something like this. Okay. What happened is that this gross area, the whole gross area, I mean that the whole gross area if we're talking about. It's not with the inclined part, it is it should be with the like the horizontal one, okay? I mean that the projection, horizontal projection. Yielding will take place. Not rapture. Yielding. You're going to find yielding that is going to take place on this on the surfaces here. Okay? So the nominal block shear strength is therefore 82.5, which is the least one. So answer if we're going to go for LRFD, phi is 0.75 times Rn, so it is 61.9. If we're going to go for ASD, it is Rn over safety factor 2, then we're going to have 41.3. Okay, so the same nominal is going to be used here. Okay, clear for you? Okay, now let's go to the next part, and I hope that we are going to finish within five minutes. Okay, roof structure. It's only for the information because commonly, like tension members also use here, uh, whenever that you are going to see like warehouses, you're going to find this arrangement of corrugated sheets and frames or truss frames and you're going to find members that is running like in this direction, right? And there are some bracings here, right? So the point is, we are having, these are what we call them, these elements, we call them purlins, okay? They are going to take or receive the loads from the cover or the corrugated sheets and they are going to transfer it to the beam here or the truss if we're having uh, a truss, for example. Okay, so they are, these are like, these are the, they are like the sag rods here that is connecting between the main, uh, the main berlins and these berlins here, we're going to find that commonly we arrange them at the nodes of the truss if the roof is going to be uh, truss, okay, commonly Roof trusses are spaced uniformly along the length of the building. They are tied together by longitudinal beams called purlins and cross bracing. As we said, these are cross bracing and they are, these ones are the purlins. Primary function of purlins is to transfer roof load to the top cords of the trusses, as we said. And they also work as part of the spacing, uh, bracing system. Purlins are usually located at truss joints as I said it here, so always we can find it at the truss joints. Okay, not going to give more about this because it's only for information. Commonly, this is like uh, tension members. Also, these members can be used or designed for tension members. Now let's go to the last part, which is related to the slenderness of tension member. Slenderness of tension member. Actually. Slenderness in general, this term commonly used for compression members, not tension members. But although slenderness ratio is critical for compression members, it is recommended that the slenderness ratio L over R not for tension members to be less than 300. It is only what? It is recommendation for us. It is recommendation. But we, we want to know why this recommendation there. 
In many situations, however, it is a good practice to limit the slenderness of tension members. If the axial load in a slender tension member is removed and small transverse loads are applied, undesirable vibrations or deflections might occur. So it is, it is the case where that, for wind, for example, that we are designing a member for wind under tension, where it's designed only for tension. But for any case, for any case, if it will be going to have a very small compression force then or vibration, it will make like this vibration is not required. So we are putting this tension um, slenderness ratio for tension members based on this. These conditions could occur, for example, in slack bracing rod subjected to wind. This is a common case for uh, where that uh, the bracing, even that it's tension, primarily designed for tension, but it might have this kind of compression force. For this reason, the user note in AISC ASIC D1 suggests a maximum slenderness ratio of 300, the user note. Okay. It is only a recommended value because slenderness has no structural significance. It's recommended okay, for tension members. And the limit may be exceeded when special circumstances warrant it. If we are sure there is nothing would happen, then it's okay. The limit does not apply for cables and rods. It doesn't apply for cables and rods. Okay. Do you have any questions? Is it clear for you? Okay, so we may wrap up this. Thank you and see you in the next uh, video.